All right, we left off last time with a site map problem. And let me just try to um, review what happened and, and, and talk about this, because it actually is a, a different flavor of the same issue that we had uh, concerning the validation, is that they added stuff to the ASP.NET framework where you can choose different ways to handle different things. So back in the old days, you know, in uh, you know, 2010, let's say, uh, you simply defined a sitemap XML file and you were good to go. Whereas now you have options like to put it in a database, which gives for more flexibility and so on and so forth. But in some cases, it's kind of overkill. All right. So what they did is they allowed you to define different providers for some of these things. Just like they, get, they allowed you, and again, it's an extension of that component ideology that, you know, each thing is like its own little piece, this own little component that, that handles a certain aspect of, of the application. And they gave more options for it, which is good, right? I mean, you could argue like for users sometimes too many options is not a good thing if it confuses them, but we're, we're pros here, right? So we don't worry, we're not scared away by options. What I don't like about it is that, in my opinion, if you have a product and you enhance it, all right, and you add some features to it, the default ought to be that it behaves like it did before. You should have to do nothing to make it behave like it did in an earlier version, all right? And that's what I don't like about going, and I think this change was made in the 4.5 framework when they added these things in. I think it was then. I could be wrong. But you actually have to change your code to make it work in the, in the new framework. And it would be easy enough to have it default to the old way of doing things if you omitted it. And so that's, I guess, philosophically, I don't like about um, the way they handle that particular change. So anyhow, it's not an excuse. You know, I should know these things and all that. But you can't know everything, and, and that's why you have Google. All right. So, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, yeah. Why should I have this job? It's like, well, you know, I took a few classes, and I'm really good at Google. You know. Pardon me. I know exactly what to search for. I know exactly what to search for. <laughs> well, that, that's the problem. That's why boy, students ask me sometimes for advice for like hiring, like, you know, do I need a bachelor's degree? Do I, you know, what will an associate degree? Do I need experience in this, that, and the other? That's the problem is, is that you never know who you're talking to on the other end, right? I mean, the person could have some very heavy preferences, you know, towards what your background is. Or, you know, there's some people that are like, I don't care, you know, as long as you can do the job. I don't care if you never went to school. You know, if you can demonstrate that you can do the job, that's fine. So, but you just never know who's on the other end, you know, and, and that's what's challenging about it. Now, the, the positive, the positive side of that is that um, it only takes one to get a job, right? You know, you can have 20 rejects and, and, and one acceptance and, and you've had a good, good, month or whatever, a good year of, uh, of interviewing, right? So that's sort of the good news of it, is it only takes one. And, uh, and again, the more, and after you get, ex again, the age-old dilemma, how do you get experience to land? Well, there's some ways that you can do that. But, um, you know, when you do get experience, then you get a little bit of breathing room. And plus, you're, you're addressing it from a position of, uh, I don't want to say power, but you're addressing it from a, a less uh, desperate situation. You know, if you already have a job and you're looking for another one, you can be a little choosier uh, yeah. than that. Absolutely. Um, so anyhow, um, best advice: be yourself. You know, I mean, and if it works, it it, it works. If it doesn't work, you probably don't want to work there anyhow, right? Um, and, and as the old saying goes, sincerity is important. Once you learn how to fake that, you have it made. <laughs> All right. So let's see the problem. Let's see how I corrected the problem. Let me run it. 
and yeah. we got an error when we went to this page because we have changed our navigation to be bound to the sitemap file. And to recreate the error, for those of you who missed last episode, previously, previously yeah, I like to do that, I like to give the little recaps. Our problem looked like this. I didn't have this chunk in the web config file. And therefore, when I ran the application, it didn't know what to make of my sitemap. All right? And it used a default in the server's config file. All right? The machine config file, and you can see the path way down there. All right? And I could go in there and change it. But um, I, can, I'm, I'm, I could change it there, but I'm going to change it in the web config file. That way, um, you, if you download this code, it will work. And really, the change I made was this. I put in, and, and this is in the new version of Rabbits that's out there. By the way, sometimes I'm sloppy and I don't like change the name of things, so there might be two things in a folder called Rabbits. Generally, they're in chronological order. Uh, so, in other words, like after Thursday's lecture will be Thursday's example. All right. Um, but anyhow, I put this chunk of code in there, and this simply tells ASP.NET where to get the sitemap from. In other words, we're not storing it in the database. We're storing it in a sitemap file. So you have to do that every time? Like You'd have to do that for every application, yes. So... What we should do is we should make a web config file that has the simple validation and this, put it out there. Um, that'd be great if one of you guys did that. All right. That'd make Extra me happy. Credit. Pardon Extra me? Credit. Extra credit? Um, I, I don't know. I think we're all going to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stay for Yeah. The one that always cracks me up, I don't know if I told this class or not, but I, I've had students complain that, like, this assignment's only worth five points. In my other programming class, the assignments are worth 30 points. And it's like, well, yeah, but it's out of 50,000 points in that class, and it's out of 100 points in this class. So it still, like, is the same thing. Or this may even be more valuable, you know, the whole percentage thing. You know, these aren't, like, dollars, like, where... 300 of them are better than five of them, right? It depends on, it's the percentage that really matters. But anyhow, anyhow. Yeah, that's always, there's, it is funny. There's certain complaints, you know, I get evaluations and I see some complaints and I can look at it and say, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, that's something I should work on, you know. I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable enough to say that. But when I see some comments on those evaluations, it's almost like, I'd just like to talk to these people for a couple minutes and just like give like, like they do in, in an election where like the one person talk or like the president talks and then they have like someone from the other side like give their rebuttal or whatever. I'd just like two minutes to rebut this person and just like, you know, explain to them how that works. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there. Now when we do this, we have our code working again when we put that back in. And notice that my structure here matches the structure of the XML file. In other words, there's a home root node, and underneath that there's Flemish Giant, Dwarf, and Karen Feeding. That echoes the structure in the web config file, um, I'm sorry, the sitemap file, where we have A root node, that's our home page, and those three pages underneath that. All right. A 
again, with XML, like with any uh, markup or any programming language, really, um, you, you want to make sure the indentation is meaningful and shows something. That's why I nudged that one over a little bit because it was, it was spaced out. One other thing, just like in HTML, this indicates that this tag is a start and ending tag rolled into one. So you don't have to have a separate start and ending tag. This says that this tag serves both the role of the starting tag and the ending tag. All right. Now that we've defined our sitemap, we can use that for two things. The first thing is, is that in our navigation, In our navigation, we can use that as the data source for that component. All right? This is a key concept. And as we get into databases, either today or next week, this will be a critical concept. In other words, again, it's the whole notion of separating content versus presentation, data versus appearance or UI. Our data for this is a hard-coded in the control. This menu is simply a way of presenting our links. The data from it comes from the sitemap XML file. Well, we'll do that a lot when we do databases. In other words, we're going to define a grid, like a table, that we're going to have the results of a query. So if you search for a book in a library, it shows you a list of books or something like that. All right. We're going to define in the ASPX page two components. We're going to identify a UI, in other words, what it's going to look like, and then we're going to identify a second piece to say, here's where you get the data from. And the nice thing about that is that you can change one without affecting the other. All right, so I could change the way that I'm going to show it to the user without having to change the data. So if I want to rearrange columns or something like that, the data is the data. And I can rearrange the presentation however I want. All right. So this is the first example of what's called binding, where you take a data source and link it to some visual control, and the data for that visual control comes from the data source. All right. So that's one thing that we can do. We can bind that, that sitemap data either to a menu or a tree. All right. The other thing we can do is we can create what are called breadcrumbs, typically called breadcrumbs, um, in uh, in um, uh, ASP.NET terminology is called the sitemap path. What that shows you is that it essentially shows you how you got there. So for example, underneath home, underneath home is these three things. So if I click on Flemish Giant, I want to show Home, Flemish Giant. All right. I think I showed you an example from LC's site where it shows the path of how you got there. That's a useful navigation tool. You know, what if you're going to summarize navigation, the purpose of navigation is to show you where you are, all right, um, where you've come from, and where else you can go. And so the sitemap path is valuable with that. All right. The other thing you can do is use a visited link style to show, indicate where the user has been as well. All right. Okay. So let's go and let's put the sitemap path on. Now, where do you think I should put that? Pardon me? Yeah, part of the nav. Should it be on the individual pages or should it be on the master page? Individual pages? Master page. <laughs> yeah, we want it on every page, right? And fortunately for us, the sitemap path control is smart enough to know what page you're on and display the proper thing. So it's not like we're hard coding this, all right? It uses the site, it looks at what page you're on, looks at the sitemap uh, uh, file, and sort of figures out how you got there. So. I'm going to go on the master page, and I'm going to put in here. Sitemap path. So go and drag it. Well, I could put it anywhere. I'll put it up 
here. All right. And what this is going to do is it's going to show me where I am in the structure. So I run this. And notice it shows home, and I'm currently on the home page. What am I doing wrong here? Let me go to the code view. This, by the way, is another good reason to look at uh, the code view, right? So you can go in here. I want to put the site map path on its own line, so I'm going to make this. I'm going to put a paragraph here, or I guess I could put a div. And now it shows it up above there, the path. So if I go to dwarf, it shows me home dwarf. All right. Now, of course, that color is hard to read on the background. All right. Plus, I might want to put a little bit extra space between that. How do we do that? We do that via CSS. All right. How are we going to write the CSS? Well, there's a bunch of ways. But the way I like to do it is look at the HTML that got generated. So I will go view source to view the HTML that got generated. The ID is sitemap path. And there are links in there. So I think if I create a, a style for sitemap path and a style for links within there, I ought to be okay. So let me go and do that. So I'll go in my CSS code. And I can define, because I know the HTML that got generated. It is called map path one and uh, what am I going to do here? I'm going to say margin bottom. 10 pixels to give it a little bit of space. I'm going to give it a different background color. That ought to do it. Uh, white might be good, but I'm not sure. Yeah, let, let's go. Let's give it this is a background color. See what that comes up with. All right. So now we run it and we should be in good shape. All right. It's a little bit hard to read at home, but, and I'm also surprised it did not give me Oh, you know why? Because span is because sitemap path is a span display inline block. This is just me being a perfectionist. All right. Essentially, what did sitemap path translate to? It translated into a span. Can you put a margin on a span? No. A span is an inline tag. So what do you do? Well, this sounds like something that a kid would make up. Well, uh, it's inline and a block tag at the same time. Well, that's what inline block does. 
is allows you to set allows you to keep it as an inline tag, but set the attributes of a block tag like margin and all that. So we go and do this, and we should be okay. Notice we now have that gap there. Now, if we don't like the structure of this, for example, if you remember my original thing, I sort of had a case where um, underneath home, I had a breeds section. All right. Well, I can do that simply by changing the sitemap. And the nice thing is, is that will adjust both the menu and the sitemap path. So let me run this just to show you what I mean. If I go to any of these pages, they're all off the home. So I go to Flemish Giant, I'm off the home Flemish Giant. If I go to Dwarf, I go to Dwarf, and so on. I might want to have where there's home breeds Karen feeding. All right. So let me go and put that middle level in, the breeds level. I think we had that in the original navigation. So, again, I'm not changing the way it looks. So I don't go into the um, visual aspect of it. I'm changing the way the data is structured. Again, we have that separation between the two. So I'm going to go into the sitemap path, and I'm going to try this. We'll see if it works. I'll put my sitemap node here. I'm going to put no URL. Let's see what it makes of that. Because I don't have a separate breeds page. Breeds is just sort of a way of classifying these other tags. I think I'm able to do this. And then I put the ending tag like this. All right. So this sitemap node for breeds contains these two sitemap nodes underneath it. All right. So now if I run this, I get home. Ah, no, no URL. It, I have to have some URL. So let me go and fake it out by putting in a pound sign. Or if I had a breeds page, I could make I could make a breeds page as well. But let's try this. Home, breeds, and then Flemish Giant. Now we're back to that old problem that we had before of I probably created it for level one and I need to do it for level two. So let's go and fix that. Actually, I did it for level two. I should do it for level three. So the pound sign just kind of tricks it to think there's a, like a URL there? The pound sign is a link to the top of the page. Okay. Yeah, so it tricks it to thinking is there's a URL there. If you need a URL and you don't know what to put, put a pound sign. That means back to the top. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. <laughs> things were kind of right on top of each other. Now notice that it says home, breeds, nice. dwarf. If you click breeds, though, it'll take you to the top of the home page. Because oh, okay, cool. that's, that's, that's where it's linked to. Exactly. 
All right. So we could fiddle with this and and maybe dot some I's, cross some T's. I said that right, right? Yeah. I on occasionally say cross some I's, dot some T's, but that, that's not a good idea. All right. So now we have a set of tools that help you UI-wise, all right, as far as common code, all right? And so, you know, to review, what are they? We have the master page, which for a site you should at least have one because you want a consistent look and feel. So from now on, even if the assignment is only one page, use a master page, all right, just, just to get in the habit of doing it. I, I can't imagine ever really doing a page without having a master page because even if I know it's a one-shot deal, uh, I might, uh, you know, one-page site, uh, I may add a page at some point and in, in I would want uh, the consistency. We have the navigation elements, which include the menu and include the tree view. All right. We then have the site map and the site map path. And additionally, we can bind the navigational elements, the site, uh, the, the menu and the um, tree view. We can bind that to the site map file to get some level of consistency and to separate the one from the other. Now I know what I know one thing I wanted to do on this is I want to go back to the menu and I want to change the menu so that it will show like it did before where it shows the top home along with breeds and care and feeding. And that would be static display levels instead of one. I'll make that two. And now we have this. Notice it's off a teeny bit. Why is it off a tiny bit? Because I put padding on level one and two. So I should be able to take care of that. I don't know why I am so obsessed with like getting this one really perfect. But you have to do level one, right? And now we should be in good shape as far as that goes. I was last night. I mean, I'm the same way. I like the question. Perfect. All right. All right. Questions about any of this? Nope. Right, it's a good practice to get into using these, even if the assignment doesn't really seem to call for it. All right. Because on any larger assignment or any larger project, you'd want to do that. Speaking of projects, what week of the semester are we? Six. Six. How many weeks are there in the semester total? Sixteen. Fifteen or sixteen, depending on how you score it. I'm going to say fifteen because it's more dramatic and it's easier to do the math. Six out of fifteen is what percent? Forty percent. 40% is nearly what? Half. Nearly half, <laughs> nearly 50%, right. It's nearly halfway through the semester. So I'm still looking for the classroom here, you know, every Thursday, like, where is this again? And oh, yeah, it's in that room. But yet we are nearly halfway through the semester. All right, Near, <laughs> nearly halfway through the semester. What that means is it's not too early to start thinking about your project, all right? At least now. Now, you know, day one is probably not too early to start thinking about your project, but now you can actually start sort of some tangible work on it because you have a sense of how to make a site that's consistent. 
Now, what don't you know how to do? You don't know how to do the database stuff. That you almost have to trust that you will be able to do it by the end of the semester. All right. I've heard people say, I've had people say uh, they were concerned about turning into design. It's like, well, we haven't covered how to do that in class yet. And that's fair. I mean, if you're going to design something, it's a good idea to know how to do it. But the timing of the course, you know, I don't want to have to wait until the last day and give you two days to do this project, right, where we've learned everything that we're going to in this class. So some of the things like doing a database query, just realize that, yeah, you'll know how to do that by the time it's to turn into project. Adding stuff to a database, yeah, you'll know how to do that by the end of the semester. All right? And as far as the GUI aspect of it, a lot of that you, we have taken care of with this. So as far as creating the master page and, and maybe a home page or something like that, you probably could start on that, um, you know, now. All right, so let's look at what your project entails. All right, your project is to be done in two pieces, the design and then the final version. So many things are about the planning more than the execution. So many things. And software development is definitely one of those things, and web development is one of those things, and all that. If you remember, I won't turn the lights on, because we just need to know the basics of this. The curve of cost of fixing something versus stage of the project. That curve goes like that. In other words, the further along that you find a problem, the more costly it is to correct it. All right? Software always looks like this. From the first software that was developed, all right, the curve was like this. Now, what does that mean? This means two things. All right? By applying good software development practices, like breaking things into components, making reusable stuff, we can flatten that curve a little bit. Maybe make it like that instead. There's nothing we can do to change the shape of that curve, the, 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 the general shape of that curve, the fact that it is first derivative is positive. It's increasing at an increasing rate. All right? But we can flatten it out a little bit to make it not quite so painful if we have to change something. All right? So good programming practices can drop us down from the horrible curve to the less horrible curve. All right? The other thing we can do is spend a lot of time in this area. Sometimes I've heard it called top loading or front loading is probably a better way to say it. Front loading means spend a lot of time in the planning stages. All right? That can only do so much. That can make sure that most of the things that we catch are in this zone, and we have fewer things in this zone. Again, can't change the shape of the curve. That's just how software is. All right? The analogy is like building a house and deciding you want a new bathroom while the architect is still sketching it out or waiting until the architect is finished and the house is actually built and then deciding you want a new bathroom. One is going to be a lot more expensive than the other, all right? Um, still going to be additional expense, right? I mean, you're still putting in a new bathroom, but one is minimalized and the other is maximalized. Maximized. Maximalized. Maximalized. That's my, that's my contribution to the English language for today, maximalized. All right. So we're going to spend a lot of time here. And design is just another way of saying planning. And it's my experience that so many things, software being one of them, planning is the key. I mean, in diverse walks of life, right? If you're writing a term paper, 
planning is the key, right? So even in an English class, or if you're writing that, planning is the key, all right? I do radio shows. Uh, um, here I'm on WOBC in Oberlin. Now, it's fun being on the microphone, but really, the key to a successful show in my mind is thinking about what you're going to do first and having a plan to go in. All right. That way you're not sitting there like, uh, where was that file? Well, what was it I was going to play? You know, and all that. So planning is key in almost anything you do. So that's all I mean by design, is planning ahead. Now, what, what does planning constitute for projects like this? All right. I would define what we're doing in this class. We haven't done it quite yet, but what we're moving towards in this class is developing web applications as opposed to websites. You know, web pages that actually do something in an interactive way that stores data, retrieves data, does everything that like a desktop application would do, all right, but it's available via the web. So, in the, uh, for, for these sorts of sites, there's a couple of things that are key. All right, number one is the database design. And number two is the, the look and feel of the site. So, let's look at the project description online, which I know you've all read, so this will be review. Of course. <laughs> let's say, waiting to see just how hysterical the laughter is on that statement. Maybe I'll change it one of these days. <laughs> and I'm sure I will get an announcement saying that I have changed the syllabus. For, you guys probably won't, right? I made an announcement, and it is telling me that. Make sure you have. Yeah, I created and changed assignments. I don't get it. Oh, well. Anyhow, modules. Semester projects. Project instructions. In some respects, this is similar to the project that, that many of you had in CISS 216. Uh, and you actually could take a very similar approach, but we're taking a slightly different approach because I want to, uh, one of the key components of this project is uh, the database design. So decide on a purpose for your application. All right. I'm going to read every word to this to you because I know students love that. Be creative. All right. Here's the idea. Pick something fun, all right? Keep in mind that you don't have to solve the entire problem. You just have to solve a piece of it. So whatever you do, do a good and complete job of it, all right? I'll give you a for example. I had a student create an online application to do polls. You know, like, um, are you team... Edward or Team Jacob, all right? Actually, this, that's what the person was based on. They were a Twilight fan, so they did it on that, all right? So that would be one question, you know. What was your favorite Twilight book? One, two, or three, however many of them there were. And you could, you could pick the answers. Well, their web application was simply the polling and the reporting of the polling. They didn't uh, have anything in their application that allowed them to add questions. They had to go through the back door into the database and add questions that way. That's acceptable. You don't have to do everything about your problem. You don't have to have a comprehensive solution. You can go in and manually enter some of the data in your application. You do have to allow the users to enter some data um, through the application. That's one of the requirements. But you don't have to solve everything. Um, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. All right. 
In that case, they did not give a comprehensive solution for creating a polling application, but they did give um, the piece that they did, they solved completely. All right. The, the typical issue that we have with this is I, I, I run into three problems, and we'll, we'll address them in order. One is picking a topic that's too broad. One is picking a topic that's too narrow. One is All right. the hardest part for me to do, and it's like, well, that's interesting. All right. Uh, let's talk, you know. I mean, I could assign a topic to you if you're really that troubled about coming up with a topic. Or we can talk and we can figure out one. Yes? Um, I'm not sure what you want us exactly to do. Does it have to be like a game that we have dice? No, no. Like a radio buttons and you pick something? Or do you need to have a database? Okay. You do need to have a database. Yes. You do need to have a database. Okay. And then in, in a second here, I'll talk about the requirements of what your application needs to do. Oh. All right. And beyond that, you're free to do whatever you want. So that's kind of the requirements. One thing would be to pick something too big. All right. So, you know, I am going to create my own version of Netflix, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> right? Good job. Actually, was it Netflix or Amazon that offered a prize for anyone that could Im improve their recommendation uh, software? You know, if you like this, you might like that. One of them offered like a gigantic prize to people to, to who could substantially improve their... Free Netflix. Yeah. Um, but you could do something like, I'm going to create a site that I can post movie reviews to and people can comment whether they agree or disagree. All right? That would be one piece of the entire Netflix pie, so to speak. All right? So one problem people have is coming up with too broad a topic, and if you have that, that's one of the reasons for the design, is that, um, you know, we can talk about it, and I can, I can hopefully point you in the right direction before you get too far along. It's amazing, as, as a teacher, and, I, and I'm not saying this to anyone in this room, but it's amazing how, like, you know, you'll give an assignment like that, and you'll see one student turn in, a uh, entity relationship diagram with like 20 database tables and relationships that look like, you know, the grids of New York City, you know, things just tied together all these different ways. And then you'll have another student that will turn in an ERD of just like one table. Yep, here's my table. You know, I'm putting stuff in my table, you know. And both of those are not what I want. There needs to be some level of complexity to it. It's simply, you know, it's simply, um, you know, simply to put information in, get it out, isn't enough. On the other hand, I don't want you spending thousands of hours and and working on this um, because, again, you know, if you can demonstrate you can do a small one, a bigger one, in many cases, is simply more of the same, just more stuff to it. All right, so if you can do a handful of tables, all right, then I'm confident that you could do a bigger project. All right. I do want you to, do, I do want whatever you do, though, to be focused at sort of solving some sort of problem or serving some sort of need. All right. I don't just want simply, I'm going to put in this data and I'm going to get it out. It should be meant to sort of solve some kind of problem. So, talk to me if you have an idea for a topic and you're not sure if it's too broad or narrow, and I can set, you know, we can, we can talk about it and get on the right track. However, that's part of my grading your design, is also looking at what you've turned in and say, hey, that's way too broad, or hey, that's way too narrow. 
If you don't have an idea, then again, we should talk to come up with something. All right. Um, absolute worst case scenario, if you're really totally undecisive, indecisive, uh, you know, I'll make up one for you, and that'll that'll take care of it. But it's usually more fun if people come up with ones of their own. All right, each part's worth 20 points, and that is to to emphasize that the design is is critical. All right. It's not just your execution of the design. One of the worst scenarios for everyone concerned is where you have a beautifully executed application, one that was written well, but doesn't serve the need that it was set out to do, right? I mean, that's frustrating for everyone. That's frustrating for the programmers because they're being told that their application stinks, all right? It doesn't stink on one level that it, it may technically be sound, and it may do what the programmer intended it to do. On the other hand, if it doesn't really serve the need of why it was created, then on another level, it's not a good application. And of course, the users are going to be frustrated by that as well. So bottom line is, the design is critical, as is the actual execution. In the design, you're going to have a few paragraphs describing the purpose of the application, and you're going to define the goals. What is your goal in creating this site? And I know this is a lot like, why do you want to work at my employer? You know, because I want a job. Why, what is your goal for creating this to get a good grade? I know, but put yourself in the shoes of whoever is commissioning you to do this site. You know, this site is meant to be entertainment for the fans of Twilight. That's a goal, right? This, this uh, allows uh, mem uh, fans of Twilight to express their opinion and debate um, whether Jacob or Edward is dreamier. All right, That's the second uh, uh, goal that you might have in doing this, and so on. All right. Included in here, and I don't explicitly say this, but included in here is you should have some idea of what, of like what your audience is. Who is this meant for? So if you're doing a, a site on really any topic, you know, you could be heading, you know, you could be focusing on the experts, you could be focusing on the novices, you could be focusing on adults, you could be focusing on younger people. So that's kind of part of the goals is to say sort of who your intended audience is. You know, a you know, a, a site for the general public about Star Wars versus a site for the Star Wars fanatic is apt to have two different sets of goals. An entity relationship diagram for your database. All right. We'll be talking about entity relationship diagrams starting either end of day to day or um, more than likely on Tuesday. It's about 12 after now, so I don't, I don't think I want to start databases today. A listing of what pages you're going to have in your application and a description of the page's purpose. How many pages do you need? As many as you need, right. And it's like, it's funny because, you know, it's kind of fun to be a teacher because a lot of times the right answers sound like me trolling, you know. But it really isn't, you know. How many pages do you need? Well, you need as many as you need, right. Well, you need to serve your goals and you need to fit the requirements. Because people usually don't like those open-ended answers, I usually say, you know, four or five-ish kind of pages, you know. Not, you know, more than ten, you're probably working too hard. Less, three or less, you're probably not working hard enough. All right, so that gives you sort of a ballpark range uh, to, to fit in. The requirements are down here. You need a master page. You need a sitemap page. Oh, I even say you need four other pages. I guess that answers that, what is enough. So that would be a total of five pages, a master page and then five other pages. And you need to do, these four pages all need to interact with the database. So if you have a home page that doesn't interact with the database, that's fine, but that doesn't count to you towards your four other pages. All right. You need to do the following in your 
application. Do a query based on criteria, all right? Like a search. So don't show me every character in Star Wars. Show me every character that appeared in The Empire Strikes Back. That is a query based on some criteria, all right? Perform inserts, updates, and deletes. So somewhere on the site, you need to do an insert, do an update, and do a delete. All right? It could all be on the same page. That could be one of your pages has the ability to insert, update, and delete stuff. All right? Or you could have insert on one page, update on another page, delete on a third. Show header detail data. Now, some of these things we will talk about <coughs> in more in depth as we go on and talk about databases. When I talk about showing header detail, I mean showing essentially a one-to-many relationship in the database, showing that on a page. So, for example, Empire Strikes Back. Here's a DVD cover. It was released in 19, I don't know, 80. Maybe not. Um, thank you. 82. That's, that's later than I thought. I thought it was, I didn't think it was. Star Wars was 79. Okay. Um, then things like, um, you know, directed by. I don't need to know the answer. <laughs> I shouldn't know not to use this example if I gave the actual, you know. I'm surprised someone hasn't said, well, actually the title of it is Episode 5. <laughs> uh, that's the header. In other words, that's the one in a one-to-many database relationship. The details could be a list of the actors that were in it. You know, Yoda played by himself. Um... <laughs> Han Solo played by Harrison Ford, and so on. So there's detail. We have information about one thing, and then we have many related pieces of data to it. So that's what I mean by header detail. All right. In database terms, for database fans out there, you're showing on a page a header detail relationship. You're showing some data from the header, some data from the detail. In terms of like uh, an order entry system, you know, uh, the header would be who's placing the order, when they place the order, and the detail would be all the items that are on the order. So you have one header, many items. So anytime you have one, many, that's what I mean by header, header detail. Your site should look professional, employ good code, uh, coding practices, be accessible and cross-browser -brow compatible. In other words, don't forget everything that you know about web design. Now, different people come in here. Some of you may have had 216. Some of you may not have 216, if I remember the prereqs correctly. Um, that doesn't mean you don't put some effort into the appearance of it. All right? If you have had 216, then it's a great chance for you to practice using what you learn there in another context, on a dynamic site instead of on a static site. Um, but it should do what a good website does. I mean, it should look like a good, completed website. And it should fulfill its purpose. All right? User-friendly, fully functional, does what you said you're going to do. Doesn't have to be extensive, but whatever it does, it should do completely. All right. Now I realize some of these things might still be a little vague. Spend some time thinking about them. We can discuss them. We can discuss it in class if you have questions. Um, as we proceed on through the rest of the semester, this project becomes increasingly important. So I'm more than welcome to take up class time discussing questions or issues that you that you have with. Uh, understanding what you what it is you need to do. Um, and do remember that you always have less time than you think you do. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, so, you know, and this is one of those things, you know, that, you know, probably every instructor says, um, and, and, and some people pay attention, some people don't, but, like, I feel obligated to say, <laughs> you know, don't wait till the last minute. All right. Um, start working on it. Give yourself some breathing room. If anything, get it out of the way. Um, you know, get aspects of it away as you can so you're not hit up at a crunch at the end of the semester. Again, some of these things you don't know how to do today, like these things. Maybe if you've had 143, you know about creating an entity relationship diagram. So you could, you could probably start thinking about that. That's where we'll pick up next time and review that. But yeah, maybe you don't know how to interact with the database, but you will. So you can plan on being able to do that sort of thing. And the, you know, a good part of the rest of the semester will be devoted towards doing that. Any questions here? All right, two days in a row, I believe. I am ending early. Wow, I'm really slacking. I'm going to go until 2.30 on Tuesday next week just to make up for it. All right, we'll see you over in lab. almost always get some sites about role-playing games, their characters, and I was going to say, I'm, I'm playing ESP, and like their, uh, what would you say, abilities, powers, whatever. Full-fledged Skyrim, top time head, skin tone, chin length. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Cool. Have a great weekend. You too.